Well, I am thrilled to be joined today by Andy Volnow. Thank you so much for joining me today, Andy. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. So um, I want to start because ISC2 just in September put out your annual um, workforce study, or at least the first look of it. And before yeah. we dive into it, um, can you tell me a little bit about the the history of ISC2 and doing these workforce studies and why it's so important for the organization to kind of have a, a finger on a on the pulse of global profession like you do today? Sure, I'm happy to. And thanks for the question. Um, so, so very briefly, the, the workforce study is, I think, about three or four years old now. Um, it, it, it was started by uh, clever people before I joined. So uh, I, I can just take the credit of their work. They're not here um, to defend themselves. Uh, exactly. Um, so, you know, as you know, IC2 is, is, is one of the world's sort of largest sort of membership associations for cybersecurity professionals. And we thought it was really important for us to take a, an annual pulse check of how the profession is feeling about certain issues uh, on a regular basis so that we can feed that um, feedback uh, back into a number of places uh, within our own organization in, in some of the professional education and learning and development tools that we, we offer our membership. Um, so we can feed it back into uh, governments as they're thinking about policy, especially around important areas like um, AI. Um, but also as they think about developing their workforce um, in cybersecurity as well. So we can feed it back into organizations who we work with, um, who are, you know, in, in financial services or, or in um, energy or government or wherever it is, um, so they can understand what's going on with, with cybersecurity professionals. But also it's a really important um, benchmark for a number of tangential issues that we see in cybersecurity around things like um, uh, burnout in, in the profession and, and the sorts of things that cybersecurity people are, are, are looking at, uh, things like investment in cybersecurity teams, um, both in career investment, but also skills training and development, what skills are important to cybersecurity professionals and hiring managers so we can, we can try and match them up there. Um, but also important topics like DEI and and what the state of um, the 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 diversity and inclusion in um, in cybersecurity is. So it, it tells us all of these things uh, on on an annual basis. One of the things that I think you know really struck me this year was that the study indicated that this was the first year that the cybersecurity workforce growth has stalled um, with a right. relatively modest, if almost insignificant. Um, growth of like 0.1%. So we're kind of stuck at 5.5 million global professionals. What do you think are some of the reasons for that stagnation this year? Well, so what, what the recipients told us was for the first year, it wasn't um, so much a lack of talent that they were seeing was stalling the workforce, but a lack of investment. And they thought that it was attributable mainly to economic conditions that we're seeing around the world. Now, it's important to, to note there was nuance within that. We didn't see stagnation throughout, um, throughout the globe. We, we, we measure a number of different countries and, and we look at sort of recipients from, you know, from Australia all the way through Europe into Africa and, and to the United States. And yes, large markets like the US, the UK um, were fairly stagnant and that's important to to know that that's probably off quite a high base as well. You know, those are quite developed markets when it comes to cybersecurity um, in, in relative terms. Where we see a lot of growth was in some parts of, um, of Europe and places like the Netherlands um, and Germany, but also in Australia. Um, but big, big growth in places like Saudi Arabia and South Africa. And, and we think that that's down to... Um, uh, the the stance that the governments and organisations are sort of taking in those markets to try and grow and develop their workforces. Um, in Australia's case, it could be you know that they're part of the Five Eyes. They're they're quite close to China and other places like that, and so that could be taking a um, playing a role there. But the stagnation was, yes, you're right, very much sort of in the the more developed markets in the US in particular. Um, and I want to get back to to some of the the global perspective that you all have have captured in this study because I think it is fairly unique. I don't know if I've seen many that do it really truly kind of as a survey across the globe. But at least as far as the U.S., it I think it's very interesting because there's also information out there in our statistics today on the demographics and nuance of the cybersecurity workforce that support and bolster that 
hypothesis that it's not so much a lack of talent, but it's kind of where it's distributed. And so yeah. we actually see a surplus for the first time in the U.S. of, you know, cybersecurity talent at the entry level. Um, but then when you get to the the mid and senior levels, that's actually where the gap continues to either hold steady or even increase slightly. So we're not doing a great job of like pulling people through, um, which, you know, to me indicates sort of some of that, what you're hearing from some of the respondents around maybe a lack of investment or some budget constraints or things like that. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And I, I, I think, you know, we, we talk a lot about attracting new talent into the into the the um the cybersecurity workforce and and when when you think of new talent it doesn't have to be sort of graduate level you know young 18 to 21 year olds we're seeing a lot of um a lot of uh, re recipients of our certified and cert cybersecurity entrance level um certification as being sort of 39 40 and so that suggests to me that you know people are 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 getting so far in in in, in tangential or adjacent professions and then thinking cybersecurity looks really great you know i i might want to try some of that um, but but you're right. I think then you know you're you're experiencing um, a lack of investment in um, the development of that workforce to retain them. I think I think you know what we found was so we saw quite a lot of hiring freezes this year. So about thirty eight percent of our um, our, our um, respondents are reported hiring freezes, twenty five percent layoffs, thirty two percent seeing fewer promotions. And by promotions, I think that sort of encompasses career development in general. So, so once you're in, I think there's there's a lack of sort of mo mobility and movement in part due to um, a lack of investment um, from organisations. And I think in 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 some respects that could be down to a lack of um, you know awareness of what cybersecurity's role is in terms of business growth and development. Um, some, somebody once said, um, you know, if you need a fast car, you need good brakes. And, and, and we always look at cybersecurity as being the good brakes to the fast car. It's an enabler of innovation. It's an enabler of growth. But I think a lot of the organizations see it as more of a compliance function. And I think the more that cybersecurity um, professionals can, can demonstrate with with their 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 sort of CFOs and and the higher ups, that they they are a critical part of of the innovation cycle of the revenue cycle, um, the better it will become for them, and the, and the easier it will be to be invested in. But I, I agree, we're we're certainly seeing, and what we're, what what people are reporting back to us on, is is that lack of. Um, growth in in when they, when they're in the profession and i think also i mean you know you, you would know this better than i would but 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 i think um you know dei comes into this as well in terms of um you know women and people from sort of non-traditional pathways into cyber security getting in and and feeling that their their pathways may be a little bit blocked because you know cybersecurity doesn't quite know how to to grow in and and develop those kinds of people as well and so i think that's that that plays a big role in in everything we're seeing yeah it it you know it, it's impossible for me to not think especially when we kind of compare where the us is where the the rest of the globe is as you did this survey how much do you think kind of government advocacy legislation and kind of government just initiatives in kind of driving, putting a priority on this um, is impacting how we actually view the profession, its evolution um, versus it kind of self-constructing it itself. <laughs> you know, we put a lot of onus on the profession to be like, yeah, like make sure that we know that everyone takes this seriously and it's part of the revenue and we're the good breaks and everyone can go faster. But you know, many times I think that's a hard sell at the boardroom mm. level. Um, and we tend to have more sticks than we do carrots. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I, I think it's, um, I, I think partly it's, it's around, um, it's around the skills cybersecurity people want to develop. So, so within the study, we we did this shouldn't be interpreted. What I'm about to say shouldn't be interpreted as a lack of um, ambition or career development. But cybersecurity people, they they the, the, a lot of a lot of them came back and said, look, we, we're not necessarily interested in promotion. We're not necessarily interested in you know getting that senior title or becoming a CISO or whatever it is. Our our great skill is is our, our love is the job. It's it's developing. 
um, you know, the 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 systems and 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 almost the intellectual kind of um, cut and thrust of keeping an organisation safe, detecting threats, understanding algorithms, looking at really clever ways to to stop very clever people doing very very damaging things. Um, and, and that seems to be what, what drives a lot of people coming into secure, cybersecurity. And then when you say, oh, by the way, you're, you're, you're stressed, you're burnt out, you don't have a lot of resources, now go and manage those 25 people <laughs> and write loads of reports and live in Excel. That doesn't seem to be a particularly um, high motivator for a lot of um, cybersecurity professionals. And so one of the skills I think that, that, that is lacking um, within the profession is that ability to to contextualize cybersecurity within the business and as a business driver. And so I think, you know, that's an area that that if, if you want more investment, you've got to be able to convince the CFO. It's as simple as that. And if you're not convincing the CFO, then um then then you're not going to get very far. And so I think, you know, if, if there was one area that I think cybersecurity people could could really sort of look at and demonstrate that they've got an awareness of is that ability to contextualize what they do, you know, how it's going to help support revenue growth, how it's going to, um, you know, develop a, a long term work plan that can, can can bring more talent in at the right levels and then automate systems through AI or whatever it is so that you can actually reduce the, the the budgets and 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 do everything you wanted to do, but on 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 better terms for the business. So I think it's about having those kinds of conversations um, to to help support the inward investment into cybersecurity teams. Yeah. One of the things that I know came out in the first look of the study was around that the shortage of key skills, but maybe more interesting was the divergence between what professionals see as some of the major skills gaps or shortages versus maybe what HR departments organizationally view as the key skill divergences. Can you can you highlight maybe a few of those discrepancies? And then maybe my second part would be, you know, and for those who are members of ISE2 or who are considering being members, like what are some of the areas that you view being most critical from a skills development perspective for the cyber profession? Yeah, so so I think um, there was that there was that disparity between what hiring managers and hiring you know the HR teams wanted and what what professionals thought were important. Um, the professionals themselves thought that communication skills, cloud computing skills, AI skills, and GRC were among the most important. Whereas hiring managers prioritized um, yes, they prioritized communication skills, maybe a little bit less, but it was still important. But, but cloud computing, AI, and GRC were really, really low, um, and and so what what that says is 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 the the the, you know, the disconnect means that what what's coming into the organisation and what's being looked for isn't necessarily going to to fit in automatically with the teams that that, that are receiving those those skill sets. Um, I, I we we we. I haven't gone too deeply into why that is happening because that that would involve then also surveying HR teams and 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 so on. So and we we we're not we're not doing that at the moment. Um, but but what it what it demonstrates is there needs to be um, a much greater alignment between um, you know the, the the hiring functions and talking to the 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 individuals within those teams and finding out what they're dealing with and 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 the areas they feel that they are lacking in order to then um in order to then go and hire the right kinds of mixes um you know they're still getting the the cloud computing skills in it's just not, maybe not to the right level or the um the right volume um that they they're requiring and and that's that's putting more stress on the the um, the existing teams who are having to sort of cover those shortfalls, while also being told, well, we've we've hired, you know, what what's the problem? Um, so so I think there there needs to be that sort of more tight tight alignment between what what the teams themselves are saying and um, and and the HR process. Totally fair. Um, I also think we won the record for going the longest on a cybersecurity podcast without saying the term AI. Um, so I'll jump on it now. I know. Can you believe it took us this long? I think long? I said it. I, I think Maybe. I said it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but, you know, while we're on it, um, how how do you view some of the emerging um, innovations in AI and automation? Um, and what impacts do you think that they'll have on the cybersecurity workforce over the next few years? Yeah, it's um, we, we've we've 
we're, we're at the foothills of, of, of AI um, w- within our own organization and also um, and also sort of measuring its impact. And I think that's that's largely because I think a lot of organizations are. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing the, the full range of organizational stance on, on AI. You know, a lot, of, a lot of organizations are really rapidly adopting it and it's almost like a bit of a free-for-all. Um, some organizations are sandboxing it and, and, and looking at it within certain, um, certain environments in order to sort of control it and some are sort of waiting to see. So, so the organizational stance is quite varied and then the cyber teams within that have to, have to make sense of, of, of that. Um, I think what that what what cyber security professionals are saying to us is that they see both threat and benefit from AI. So it is a tool, and as a tool, it it, it has its utility, and it can also be misused and it can be used. And I think how different groups are using it and misusing it um, depends on on the situation. I think what what we're being told by the professionals themselves is that there needs to be very clear organizational policy. Um, and, and if we can start to put some policy, ethical use cases and guidelines around um, the use of AI that fits the organization and its industry and its risk appetite, then, then that will make it easier for the cybersecurity teams to start to administer it. So I think it, they're seeing it very much in the very logical way that cybersecurity people see things. You know, it, it is a tool. It needs policies. We need to have an ethical use case around it, and and they should be involved in that. But but it's not just their decision. You know, the business as a as a whole needs to have a a, a point of view about AI, especially around its eth- ethical use, and that needs to be based on its risk appetite and the industry it's in. And if that's not coming down from the board or from the management team, then it's very, very difficult for cybersecurity people to manage it. So I think, so those are some of the things we're sort of hearing back um, uh, as, as a, AI develops. Um, you know, one of the things, and maybe the last question I'll, I'll leave us with, because I think it is related to your answer. I have been so impressed over the last few years, in particular, ISC2 has been very adamant about really proclaiming and moving away from the term cybersecurity industry, um, which is someone who grew up in the space is what we kind of refer to them as, ourselves as being in the industry, but now to sort of evolving into it's we're part of a profession. Yeah. Um, and so what you're describing and kind of like those codes and the ethics and kind of what governs is some of these new technologies come out. I guess my kind of parting question is, where does ISC2 see itself really sitting in relationship to its membership, the professionals, and then the organizations and the governments that are grappling with how to kind of systematically address some of these issues, whether it's with the workforce, the advent of AI, you know, but anything else that affects the, like our cybersecurity in general. Wow, a gr- great question. <laughs> I'm and, leaving and, you uh, with a big one. <laughs> thank you. And my, my, I've suddenly got agoraphobia because my, my answer can go in all sorts of different directions and it's probably not even going to cover half of it. So thank, thank you for that, that hand grenade at the end. <laughs> no problem. Um, um, I, I love that question. Um, so, so you're right. I think, I think it is a, prof- you know, it, it's got to be seen as a profession. And, um, you know, if you, if you look at risk and compliance at the board level, you know, you can't move for financial managers, legal managers, but but where are the cybersecurity people? And and data and information is is so critical um, to every organisation. It's it's more important than anything else. And there are so many sort of risk points that it can it can be misused and leak and and what have you. And so I think um, you know the the recognition that cybersecurity and information security you know plays that that critical role in in the organisation. I think is is slightly lacking. Um, you know, there's very little um, cyber um, experience at the board level um, across across the industries. Um, so I think so. I think that's that that is a problem. Um, and also, you know, I think I was talk- I was talking today um, to 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 another um, a, a, another conversation I was having, and and you know, it occurred to me that cybersecurity is a little bit like air traffic control in the you know it, it is a high stress. Um, or, or, it, it, it so many so much relies on cybersecurity to get it right, and when it, when it goes wrong, it can go really really wrong, um, and that comes with 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 burnout, that comes with stress, that comes with with you know high degree of training, a high degree of technical expertise, 
um, you know, it, it, it really does need to be recognised um, as as the profession it is, and then and then sort of frameworks put around that in in a much more defined way that that controls sort of who can get in, um, you know, without lowering keep, keeping the gate broad without lowering the standards is is something we're all we're all trying to do, um, but then help. You know, there there is. If you look at the law, law, um, legal profession, there's any number of of structures in place. Um, you know, codes of ethics and training and degrees and, um, you know, lawyers, barristers, solicitors. They're 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 very very supported in in their profession. They they have um, you know sort of li- liability insurance. They you know it, it's it it's a very very well tried and trusted. Um, risk profession that is hundreds of years old, and I think the sooner we can get to um, to somewhere near that for cybersecurity professionals, the better. Um, and that involves organisations like ours, you know, um, pushing the agenda and making sure that that you know governments and um, other organisations um, recognise that the the UK is chartering um, cybersecurity professionals at the moment, which is again another step in the right direction of of ensuring that cybersecurity professionals are recognised. Their work to get to where they got to is very, very important, um, and therefore they they have obligations, but also they 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 have resources that they can they can benefit from and support they can benefit from, um, and organisations like ours that need to pull together things like global codes of ethics, and you know we've got all these members who are very willing and able to volunteer for us, so that what they think matters, and that should all go into into those um, you know ethical canons. Um, and, and then, you know, yes, the work the governments are doing, um, you know, we, we, um, have a very sort of strong advocacy, um, arm, which works with governments across, um, the world to try and have these conversations, um, to, to help the profession be, be sort of put up there with accountancy, with financial services, with legal, um, as, as a very high value and very, well-respected, um, you know, professional standard. Um, so, sorry, that was a bit of long-winded, and I tried to, I tried to sort of pull all the thoughts I had together in, in into one, one kind of package. But no, um, well done. <laughs> Um, I know I throw you out there with the last one, but um, Andy, thank you so much for joining. Um, if you you know want to go check it out, ISC 2's 2024 State of the Cybersecurity Workforce Study is out now. Um, do you want to throw a, a URL that people can go access what, the study or where the, can they go? Um, the, the first look is out on our website. Um, we're actually releasing the full study after Congress, which is next week. So we have our annual Congress in Las Vegas next week, and then the study's being launched after that. So we'll we'll make sure we send you a copy. Wonderful. Well, looking forward to it. Thank you so much for joining, Andy. Thanks for having me on. It was great fun.